Thank you for turning to page 121. Welcome back to page 121. Today we're going to take a look at another supplement that was published for the AD&D line very early in the game's existence. This one was published in 1980 by TSR and it's called the Rogues Gallery. This one's a little more famous than the one that featured in the in a previous video. Be, this one has a little more uh, meat to it than the others and is a little more commonly known. Here's the, the back of it. Uh, just some more of that nice, clean, first edition artwork that I still love. This one was here to help you develop your game and to develop player characters and non-player characters. This game gave you a lot of different characters to, uh, to look over and would help you design not only uh, NPCs for your dungeon, but would also help you design player characters. I would take a look at this and use it kind of as a touchstone for different characters I might want to develop sometime down the line. As you can see by the table of contents right here, it's got it all broken down by class. These are all the first edition AD&D classes. They're listed alphabetically. Every class is represented, even, even bards. And then it comes down at the bottom. It talks about caravans, city guards, things like that. I'll get to that in a little bit. So going into the book, <clears throat> this page again with some of that fine early D&D artwork. The Rogues Gallery here, it tells you exactly what it is. It's a, a guide to help you play advanced Dungeons and & Dragons and specifically help the DM to create non-player characters. I used the heck out of this book. I still actually refer to it from time to time. This book has a lot of inspiration lurking in its pages. I'm going to show you uh, the setup, the way they structured each of the NPCs, and then uh, why it was so useful. So basically, it's got the listing of all the uh, abbreviations that are used in this one, the, uh, the character's race, the gender, alignments, the stats, the levels, the hit points, all the stuff you need to actually play the character. And then it comes down to, it even goes into details such as hit adjustments, damage adjustments, dex bonus, saving throw bonus, and things like that. Then it comes into some stuff that isn't touched on much for NPCs anywhere except maybe in the Dungeon Master Guide. And this is different categories that show the age, appearance, possessions, sanity, general tendencies of the character. These are all brought out for every single player, or end player, non-player, in this book. So it gave you a real quick way to take a look at somebody and say, oh, I, I like this ranger, but this ranger is miserly. Uh, so that's something maybe I could build into it to role play it as an NPC encounter, or perhaps as somebody that they, the party wants as a hireling. Yes, I'm that old. We used hireling. Okay. The book is formatted in an inverted style like this, and lists everything just as tables. There are a percentage table next to it, or D20, depending on how many of each uh, class is presented, and you could just throw the percentage dice and up it would come, and you would have all the stats ready to go. I used this a bunch. It saved you time generating uh, thief skills, especially, because it was all right here on the table. The bard table, as you can see, there are less bard options, but there's still plenty. Again, some of that beautiful first edition D&D artwork. And I'm not mocking when I say that. I love that artwork. Uh, coming over to here, you've got your clerics and so on through the book. This book was incredibly useful. As I said, I still go into it now and again. If I'm developing a town, I'll pull this guy out. And I'll go through it and come up with some inspirations for some of the town encounters. Here we have the fighter chart. This one probably got the most use of any of them. And then straight on through. Some more of the really, really beautiful artwork. And then we're down to the illusionists. Again, not as many illusionists as some of the other classes. Simply because it went by what was the most popular class. Magic user. As you can see, there's a ton of MUs in here. And these would go from any level, from a first level hedge wizard type, all the way up to a 12th level mage. Somebody powerful. And then 
uh, monks, first edition monks, not uh, honored decana monks. And then they even went into multi-class characters. So if you wanted that half-elf fighter magic user, well, he was here. And they have a couple of pages of those. So I'll keep going on the multi-class. And some more of their very, very nice artwork. Paladins. You name it, it's here. There you go. These are the Rangers. The Rangers saw a lot of use as well. I used a lot of fighters and Rangers early in my game as NPCs, also thieves, just because they were really useful. When the town, the party would go to town to find a cleric to heal something, I'd pull this book out, throw the percentage dice, and, and there was the, the cleric that they found. Now the next section I'm going to go to is for some other NPCs that aren't of player character races, and it gives more detail encounters and things like that. Sages in early AD&D are not a player character race, or player character class. They were generally found in large cities, and you could find one to consult to find out the history of a magic item, or something about the flora in the area, something like that that would help in the game and the quest. So sages really weren't player characters, uh, but they were something that was necessary to contact. Sages saw a lot of use out of this book by me. I would add a name to them, I'd write a stat line on a sheet, and then that player, that would become an NPC that the party could go back to again. Zero level player characters. Yep, the person in the town. You need to talk to the bread baker. Okay, fine, we can pull him up here. And here's how many hit points he has, and his above average stats, that kind of thing. Caravan. You want to whip up a caravan, you're going to be guards for a caravan for the adventure. Here is the breakdown that you would need. Here's even a couple of sample caravans. Caravan number one, number two, number three, number four. So it was a good, quick way to cobble together something to help in the game you were going to be running later that day. City guards, city watch, border patrols, all broken down right here. I didn't use this as much simply because I would customize those encounters based on the pit player character group, but it's still a good quick way to find what you need. Pilgrims. I actually did use a fair amount of pilgrims. They're, they're pretty good foils in a, a game. Uh, they can have information. They can be carrying an, uh, a valuable item and not know it. Uh, they're just really good to, to be involved in the game. <clears throat> bandits, Buccaneers. Yeah, who, who didn't use Bandits and Buccaneers? I still do. Uh, bandits and Buccaneers are just a lot of fun. Good encounters. <clears throat> then it went into something that as a new DM, I really, really needed some help with. These are Kautul, Kyran, and Shadu. Good aligned monsters. I really didn't have a great grasp when I first started DMing as to how the heck I was going to actually role-play a good aligned monster. So this was very helpful to give me a good look at what powers they had and possible uh, motivations I could give them. Liches. I used both of these guys as bad guys at various points in my campaign. And honestly, I've probably used them multiple times with uh, just changing their names around a little bit. These are two really good uh, examples of a lich. Uh, one is a former 18th level magic user, and one is a former cleric magic user. Very, very formidable. And then you come down to dungeon parties. This was a good way, if you were in a dungeon, I used to like to do the occasional uh, other group in the dungeon. You aren't the only party looking for treasure, wealth, and fame. They happen to be there too, so now you encounter them. Who is it that they have on their side, and, and how are you going to deal with them? And there are a bunch of different dungeon parties given, all the way up to a 17-member party, Dungeon Party 10A, with a bunch of magic items. And then you come down to one of my favorite sections of the entire book, and probably what gave this book its notoriety, the personalities. This section was the one that really caught my interest, because these were active player characters in campaigns, specifically the D&D home campaign by Gygax and Kuntz and all them. Uh, and it actually was our first look, and for a very long time, our only look at some of these players, or some of these characters. So, <clears throat> here we are. 
There's Ararat, not one I'm familiar with, but everybody knows the next name, Bigby. There is the write-up, Bigby, Gary Gygax's character. And then another fighter, a couple of that I don't know. They must have just been players in the campaign. Here's Irak's cousin by Ernie Gygax. Also with Grim Slade. Lan Lanolin. I actually have heard of Lanolin in other places. Lanolin's just one of those names that's known. All the way down to Mordekainen. Phoebus. Rigby. These are all very famous names. Robilar. Robilar at the time was uh, Lawful Evil. Uh, they In 3rd edition, they kind of rehabbed him a little bit and uh, said it was a mirror double that was going around doing all the nasty things. I prefer my Robilar Evil. Thank you. Robilar has actually appeared as a villain in my campaign pretty often. So he'll be keeping his evil alignment. All the way down to Tensor, another one of Gary Gygax's characters. This was the really exciting part of this supplement because we actually got a look at existing player characters, higher level, and ones that were still active. Now granted, these are not officially what these characters had and how they were played, but it was a really good insight for a new DM like me to take a look at what was going on, what had gone before, what I did, how other people were doing their campaigns, and maybe give me some ideas of what I could do with my campaign. Importantly, this was the first look we had at any of these uh, characters, really, until WG5, Mordekainen's Fantastic Adventure. If you saw my previous video, you saw the end of this module, which shows four of the characters. Mordekainen, Irag, Bigby, and Rigby. Three of the four of these guys are just updates from what was presented in the Rogues Gallery. That was really exciting as well. Rogues Gallery came out in 1980. Mordekainen's Fantastic Adventure came out in 1984. It was really exciting to see them fleshed out even a little bit more than in Rogues Gallery. A nice picture of them and an idea of where they were and, and where they had been. So that was really it. I recommend Rogues Gallery highly. I know this is available. Uh, you can find it on eBay now and again, but I know it's available on DriveThruRPG as a PDF or print on demand. I really recommend this book. There is a lot in here that you can use. There's a lot in here I still use. I keep this on my, my shelf with my other books, and I refer to it still uh, pr fairly frequently. This book is over 40 years old, and it still sees some use. So that's it for today on page 121. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Well, that closes the book on another episode of page 121. Please leave your comments below, and if you enjoyed what you saw, go ahead and hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.